Well, we're continuing on looking at this LM1875T amplifier IC. Greetings, the Astro 30 here, and yes, as I just previously stated, we're going to have another look at this LM1875T amplifier IC module, whatever you want to call it. Um, in the last video on this, we looked at the datasheet implementation of using this IC. Today, we're going to look at making up a circuit board, a proper printed circuit board for it. Um, using a slightly different implementation. It still works out to be the same implementation but with a difference. Now I don't know if you guys can see this properly or not. I'm hoping you can. So what I might do is I might zoom in a little bit on the left hand side of the page here. So this is the area of interest over here. We've got our audio signal here um, both the hot and the ground. Now You'll notice that none of the grounding points that you would expect to go to ground, like this uh, end of this capacitor here should be going to ground, the end of this resistor should be going to ground, and the end of this capacitor should also be going to ground. Well, they do, but via this 10 ohm resistor. What this is called is a ground lift resistor. What that does is it uh, attempts to reduce the hum of interconnected com uh, equipment to this module by lifting the ground so that the two grounds uh, from the interconnecting com equipment and this ground are isolated from each other. That's the only reason for it being there. Now if this was actually installed in a system which had a common ground where this point is, this resistor really wouldn't be necessary. So there aren't many changes from the data sheet except for the addition of two 2.5 two amp fuses. The 100 microfarad capacitors that were here as the bypass supply or the filtering on the supply line there has been changed to 220 microfarad. These 100 nanofarads are still the same. Um, that 20k resistor in the feedback network has been changed to 22, so the overall gain is now 23. And we've also got the addition of this extra resistor and this extra capacitor. Now this extra resistor here and capacitor combine to form um, RFI filtering. So what it attempts to do is to stop any RF interference from being amplified at the sensitive input circuitry inside the IC. And you really should do something, not so much this capacitor, but this resistor anyway, which is called a stopper resistor. You should add that 1K into most op amp um, high gain stages like, such as this anyway on the input. And this comes directly off of Silicon Chip's website. Now, this was uh, designed by a guy named Peter Smith. And the actual article in question was called The Schoolies Amp, which was a amplifier project that uh, high school children and tertiary education students could use in the electronics training field uh, to build. And they were sold as kits by Alltronics and JCAR, but of course that was 2004, that was 14 years ago. They're no longer available. However, I was going to lay out my own PCB when, whilst I was looking on the silicon chip website, I managed to come across a PDF file of their copper pattern. So, this is in 300 dpi, so it should print one to one when it's finished, but I can't actually uh, supply this to anybody else uh, because it's copyright and I actually had to pay three dollars to get this but I can actually put a link in the description of this video as to where I got this so it makes it easier for you to find it if you want to download it and pay the three dollars necessary to get it and you can pay it through PayPal and uh, then you can print it out and then you can make your own circuit board and it's a single sided circuit board so it's not that difficult to remanufacture and 
of course there's no overlay so I had to take the time last night to reverse that image and then grey it out a bit so it wasn't um, too black and then draw the components in on this side and work out which resistor went where and which capacitor went where and well I think I did a pretty good job I mean as messy as it looks yes it's hand drawn but uh, eventually I um, will probably do it up properly in my CAD software um, just to make it look a little bit more clearer um, all I've got to do is just import that image into Proteus size it up to roughly the correct size so that the component pictures fit correctly and then just export out the top silk layer and then you know take an image of this and then just put the components on top of it so the plan today is to well print this out onto a piece of clear and then uh, cut a circuit board to size, piece of stock um, obviously I'm going to flip this uh, horizontally so that the toner side is facing the bed of the light table and the non-toner side is facing the circuit board um, expose the pattern and uh, yeah drill, cut, protect um, and assemble this project and see if it operates well, a little bit better than the breadboard version which it should because this is actually the correct way to lay out an amplifier this is the ground or earth point of the amplifier as you can see it's in a central point and they all go back to a central point there, there and there so that's the plan, so I've got to get a piece of circuit board cut out. I'm not going to take much video of it, it there's no point. Um, so I'm going to spend the next two hours doing that, and we'll come back when I've actually got some form of result here. Sexy! That's uh, turned out quite nice. So that uh, developed and transferred properly. Um, so now the next stage will be to etch it. I believe it's fully developed, so I don't need to do too much more developing to that. So now I can uh, move on to the next stage. All right, now I usually use about three heaped teaspoons of ammonia persulfate because, well, it seems to be about the most reactive. And I use about, well, for a board that size, about 500 milliliters of water. I put about a liter in the kettle, so I use around about half of it for now, and uh, drop the board in it, and then we begin the etching process by agitating this. And it probably would be a good idea for me to purchase a bubble tank for etching because it'll be a lot easier than doing this. Anyway, moving on, and there's the completely etched PCB. There turned out pretty good. Took about half an hour. Maybe, I'm uh, not actually sure how long it took, probably about, yeah, I'd say half an hour. I had to uh, um, add a little, another teaspoon of etchant, plus the rest of the hot water uh, halfway through because the process was starting to slow down. So, and then I got down to where there was little scarics of copper that were not coming off, so I ended up scraping it off a little bit with... Uh, just a Stanley knife here to take any coating or resist that might have been sitting on top of it so it would etch it completely off because there's nothing worse than having a line going across say the supply line and the output of the IC that would be bad so anyway the next step now is to drill it cut it to size clean it protect it and then we're ready to assemble it so I'll get busy doing that shouldn't take me any more than another 45 minutes maybe to an hour and uh, probably by uh, lunchtime we'll have a circuit board ready to assemble um, there it is all drilled cut to size cleaned and got a clear coat of protective lacquer on it I'm just waiting for that to dry so I can assemble it, so it's going to take about another 15, 20 minutes or so. And it's only just gone a little after half past 11, so it only took me about an hour to do all that. 
Actually, no, it would have been only about half an hour, didn't, wouldn't it? Because I said before I started this piece that it was about 11 o'clock or something. I think I did anyway, I don't remember. Um, anyway, all the holes drilled up to the correct sizes. Now it's just a, a waiting game. Uh, so we'll check back when that's uh, dry. So there she is all uh, complete. Um, I need to let it dry a little bit longer. It's not quite dry yet. I've even left the silicon chip logo on it plus their board code. Why? Because, well, it's their intellectual property. I'm not advocating that I'm going to take something off of a website and then claim it as my own. That's plagiarism for a start. And secondly, credit where credit is due. It was designed by silicon chip and therefore I'm leaving it as it was designed. I'm not going to add anything else to it. JCAR and Altronics add their own codes and stuff to the uh, pattern, but I'm not. I'm going to leave it as it was in the magazine. And that's basically where this came from anyway, was the magazine art. So I'm going to need to let that dry a little bit longer. So what I might do is I might break for lunch and uh, for about half an hour, it's uh, midday now. So yeah, by about half past 12, I reckon we'll get into uh, assembling this. And uh, once the assembly is done, we'll move on to the next step, which is mounting it to a heatsink. Now I've got this uh, HH8570. It's a 105 long by 55 high heatsink, which is going to be adequate enough for this small little LM1875T chip. A little bit bigger would have been probably a little bit better, but yeah. Anyway, so I've got all the parts laid off on the desk here. I've even got some low ESR 220 microfarad 35 volt capacitors. Um, don't have to use low ESR, but I'm going to because, well, they were convenient and they're in the voltage range that I need. I could have stuck 65 volt ones in there. It really makes no much difference. So everything's laid out, ready to go. M25, M205 fuse clips. I've got some 2.5 amp fast blow fuses here, 10 of them. And all the other miscellaneous parts ready to go onto said circuit board. So as I said, I'm going to break for lunch now and um, we'll come back when I'm ready to assemble. Okay, and we're back from lunch. I just had a pie and a coke. Uh, only been about 25 minutes anyway. I'm going to assemble this. I'm probably going to do it in time lapse because some people like that stuff. I've got the uh, door over here to next to me open because it's a nice, lovely, warm day. It's 23 degrees at the moment. I'm still suffering from a uh, cold or a flu or something. And got a fan going in the background there to circulate the air around the room. So without further ado, let's get started.
Okay, that only took about 15 minutes of time to do. Wasn't that overly involved. I'm just making sure that there's nothing shorting together that shouldn't be. Now I can pop a couple of fuses in. Um, these are fast blow fuses by the way. And you can tell the difference with these anyway because the slow blows are a thicker um, wire and they often look like a spring. However the fast blow ones are just a thin piece of wire and that says F 2.5A so the F stands for fast. Now if it was a slow blow fuse it would be S 2.5A so we can pop them in where they go, well try to pop them in where they go Now, albeit the scale of this board might be slightly out, um, what I did was when I was printing it, I measured between the two hole centers of this connector here, which is 5mm, same as that is 5mm, and that's 5mm. So that should be 10 to there, and 5 respectively between these two connectors, and 5 for each of the fuse clips. So as long as they are 5 millimeters exactly, 5 millimeters exactly, and 5 and 10 millimeters exactly, and this IC sits in that location properly without leads being bent over, then you've got the right scale. This board actually measures 64 millimeters by 80 millimeters wide, respectively. So the next step I'm going to do to do is I'm going to play with my penis. No, I've done that already this morning. Um, so I'm going to put some standoffs on this. Right there. Now I forgot to mention that these two capacitors, this one here, which is the input cap, which is 2.2 microfarad, and this one here, a 22 microfarad, uh, both 50 volt each. They're bipolar or non-polarized capacitors, so they can go in any way around, it doesn't matter. So now that is um, got the standoff screwed onto it. I can now think about measuring from the desk, the edge of the surface of the desk here, to the whole center of that IC so that when I go to drill this, I can get it almost practically right first time. So that lines up pretty good. Doesn't appear to be any unusual gaps. The um, seal washer that's going to go in between here and the heat sink is going to take up the gap anyway. So, okay, so that's going to be the next step is uh, measuring that. Welcome back to the floor. So, well that's in inches, that's no good to me. So I might uh, rotate that around that way. Come around the other side of the uh, tripod. Okay, so I'm looking at 25, 6, 7, oh, around 28 millimeters from the desk to the hole. So that's where I'm going to do it, it's 28 millimeters. Okay, so there's my crudely drawn diagram. I've got it 28 up that way, um, and well, 52.5 across that way to the center. There's another hole down here, 5 millimeters up. That's just for one of those angle mounted brackets so that when this is mounted to a chassis this heat sink has something to screw to so it keeps it from you know flexing backwards and forwards so that's what I'm going to do now is mark out my heat sink and drill him and then we can mount it to the power amp module and start testing Woo okay so the heat sinks being drilled and D Petrie Hawkins bird lol um yeah that was a bad joke anyway the heat sink's been drilled and deburred i've also put the uh, little bracket l bracket here on the bottom of the heat sink so now i'm ready to marry the main pcb up to the heat sink using one of these self-adhesive to220 isolator washers a bush for it 10 millimeter long m3 screw M3 nut and an M3 washer on the nut side. So let's get started with that. So I guess the easiest way with this is to actually stick this the washer, isolation washer, after removing the backing paper, 
to the heatsink first rather than to the device first I don't know if that'll make it any easier but that's what I'm going to do anyway, I can get it reasonably straight and don't forget to take off the top bit of uh, paper here if you so can it might prove challenging but sometimes it helps to have fingernails sometimes it doesn't right so that's somewhere where I need it to be so I'm going to bring that up to there roughly where it needs to be I put my uh, bushing on the head of the screw put the screw through both bits washer on the other side and this is just long enough just long enough to catch a couple of threads on the end of the the uh, screw here with the nut once it compresses down it will start uh, catching um, or maybe not I think that screw might be too short so what I'm going to have to do is change that to a 15mm long well, I've only got 20mm long screws alright I've got 20mm long screw here that's way too long but I'll do in the interim I need to get shorter ones but 10mm is too short and of course 20mm is way too long um, but yeah it is what it is so going to get that started all the way up to the heat sink and that should pull everything flush once it's all said and done so I'm going to check uh, yeah I was concerned about this nut here but it is clearing everything just fine so it should be just fine um, now I need to tighten said screw which will compress everything and that should be as tight as you need to go no tighter than that and yes at the moment the heat sink flops around that's why I said to put a bracket on it but once it's mounted in the chassis it should not be a big problem it's just that, that nut on the bottom there might be an issue it may not my suggestion would be to use a nylon one there instead so that's the uh, IC mount of the heatsink and isolated so the next test would be to check that it is actually isolated yep used to be isolated um, and also to check that the output is not shorted which apparently it is not so we're not even getting any reading uh, we're getting uh, about 1915 mega ohm or something so it's uh, pretty safe to assume that that's fine Okay, so now to hook it up to a power supply, I'm going to do a DC test on the output, make sure there's not a humongous DC offset. Okay, I've got uh, it hooked up to the power supply, power supply set to zero volt currently. Um, multimeter, which is just slightly out of shot here, is set to millivolt scale. I'm going to, no input connected, I'm going to turn on the juice and I'm going to slowly ramp up the voltage until I get around about. 15 volt thereabouts plus minus and we'll have a look at the DC offset and then we'll wind it up to the full 25 volts and make sure nothing strange happens so here we go turning it on and we look for smoke as we wind it up to its minimum voltage which is plus minus 8 the, the amplifier just turned on so the minimum it'll operate as at 4.8 plus minus 
nothing seems to be doing anything strange. We're now at 10 volt plus minus and we've got uh, minus 0.15 millivolt DC offset, not bad. Go up to the 15, we've got a current draw now of about 40 MA to 50 MA. We're now at 15 volt plus minus and we've got 0.5 millivolt minus DC offset. Again, not bad. Still 50 milliamp current draw and nothing getting strangely hot. Up to 20 volt plus minus 0.95 millivolt. Still 50 MA. Now the final 25 volt, but I'll put it about 24.1. The power supply is not exactly accurate. We now have 24.1 volt plus minus 60 MA current draw, and we've got a DC offset of minus 1.2 volt, uh, 1.2 millivolt. So only about a millivolt of output there. So that's not bad. Um, nothing is uh, getting unusually hot. Uh, so, next step is to hook it up to a speaker and see if it makes a noise. So I'll turn that off. Alright, got it hooked up to a speaker. So, I'm going to turn the juice on. Uh. Yeah, well it seems to be amplifying a signal. And picking up a bit of noise. Yeah, that was a soldering iron. Okay, fine. So we know that it's actually going to output a signal. Um, I'm debating whether or not to put it on an oscilloscope or not bother and just go straight for a sound test. But for the, in the interim, I might have a cigarette and I think about that. Okay, as that Dulux ad says, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So I'm going to put it on the oscilloscope, even though we did that in the last video. But yeah, you never know. Could end up with different results. Okay, so the yellow trace is measuring the output and the green trace is measuring the input. Currently, we're at about 564 millivolt peak to peak and the DDS is set at 500. 100 millivolts, so it's mm, a little bit out, uh, and one kilohertz, of course. So we apply the power. I've got the output on the times 10 probe, by the way. We can see we've got a larger signal on the output. Currently at 500 millivolt, thereabouts in, we're pushing 12.5 out. So that's not its uh, full power, by the way. So we're going to increase the amplitude and watch the scope screen until the amplifier starts to clip then we know that that is uh, where our power output is doesn't appear to clip yet still looks relatively clean I'm at 1.7 volt in at the moment I think it's starting to clip there so I'm going to back him off there and I might change my time base from 2 milliseconds to 1 millisecond yeah, it's not quite flat, so that would be about where I want to say distortion is. And we're drawing, yeah, about one, 1 1.3 amps. And the heatsink is getting warm. And the device, well, yeah, it's getting red hot. But that should be okay. So I'm going to kill the load after I find out what that is. That's 39.5 volt. So we were at 39.5 volt peak to peak. Divide that by 2. Equals that. That's 19. Multiply that by itself. 7.5 equals that. Divided by the load. And the order of 48 watts. That's peak. Uh, RMS, however, would be a little bit different. Right, so the input is at 1.7 there, roughly thereabouts, voltage peak to peak, and around 1.04 2 volt RMS. So if we turn the load back on, we're looking at 12.09 volt RMS. 12.09 
RMS, multiply that by itself, which would be 144 really. Um, equals, yeah, divide that by our load. We're looking at 18.27 watt average. So, yes, to say that this is a 20 watt IC would be almost quite accurate. It's a little bit off, probably about 2 watts thereabouts off, but it's close enough. Next test I want to do is I want to look at the distortion after I piss CC, uh, C cleaner off, that, off down here. Go away. Next test I want to do is at the full power range, uh, I want to change my frequency to a base frequency, say around about 60 hertz, and, and I want to look at whether or not the distortion I was getting the other day is from the chip, close to full power or whether it's from the laptop itself. So what I want is 60 hertz. So I'm gonna to have to change my time base again because that's now too quick, uh, 10. Uh, 10 milliseconds will do. So turn the load on. This will probably overshoot and clip badly. No, not really. It's still relatively clean. We're still outputting close to 12 volt um, RMS and 36.7 peak to peak. So we've lost probably about a watt there. So no, that base frequency is relatively clean. So we'll change that frequency to 120 hertz. And no, it's not clipping or distorting. So we'll go... Uh, We'll go to a frequency of 500 hertz now, which is near the mid range. So it's not clipping. Uh, change our time base back to 2 milliseconds, thereabouts. No, it's not clipping. Um, so I'm going to just reduce the amplitude down to a volt. And no, the signal looks relatively clean to me, so it's not the amplifier that was distorting, it was uh, what it was connected to that was distorting. So I'm happy that that looks okay on screen. So I'm going to let that <coughs> cool down now and turn the DDS off. And um, we'll hook it up to the laptop again, like we did in the last test and see if that annoying distortion is still there or it has miraculously gone. Okay, I got that all set up, ready to go before I started shooting. So I'll turn the, the load on. Nothing unusual coming out the speaker, so let's play some music and see if that distortion's still there. No. Interesting. We can't hear that.
Yeah, well, I thought I'd let the amplifier speak for itself, and at least that particular hip hop um, and rap dark style genre of music there was a little bit interesting, more than some of the other stuff that's on the YouTube library. That's called Black Magic by Nana Kwabena. So, yeah, you can check that out on the audio library. It's there on youtube.com uh, slash audio library slash music. So, yeah, but I thought that was actually quite an interesting track. Um, heat sink is mildly warm. And the chip is probably at the same temperature as the heat sink now. So, because of these uh, stick-on self-adhesive thermal washer things, pastes, whatever you want to call them, you've got to wait until they uh, bed themselves in. The heat will make them expand, of course. So it might be a good idea after running it for a while, just to make sure that, that screw is still tight. Uh, because you can see that the thermal compound here has started to fold over on itself. That's because it's got hot. It's probably not the best um, thermal transfer stuff in the world. I mean, that probably could. I might turn the load off first. Um, you probably could, you know, use just normal washers that don't require grease, the greaseless ones. Or you could use the mica ones with some thermal compound in there. Um, I'm in two minds as to which is which which one's better. But that's the um, LM1875T Schoolies amplifier as presented by Silicon Chip in 2004. I think it was around about September or November. I can't remember offhand. A project by Peter Smith. It uh, works and it works reasonably well. And the reason I'm probably not getting any uh, distortion from the laptop now is because of that probably most likely because of that 10 ohm ground lift resistor there. Uh, as, I, as I said before, um, having a ground lift, lift resistor there reduces the amount of hum pickup by the main amplifier from the interconnecting equipment and it can also reduce um, distortion at the input because the, the two grounds are fighting with each other. If it was going through a preamp it probably wouldn't be a problem. And as I said, if the, the preamp's uh, zero volt rail was common to the zero volt rail of the power amp, well, that ground lift resistor will be effectively shorted out when it's in service anyway. But that doesn't make any difference to it. But as it stands, that ground lift resistor also separates the zero volt rail reference of the op amp IC and the input from the output because the output goes directly to the zero volt ground reference and the input goes to this 10 ohm ground lifted reference. So you're also splitting the power ground from the signal ground. So that's another reason for using that 10 ohm resistor. Anyway, I think I've gone on talking about that long enough. Um, what I'll do is, I might before I finish editing this video and making it live, is I might import the um, artwork into um, Proteus and uh, with it flipped so we're looking at it from the component side and I'll just place out all the components on top of the original artwork and then release that as a link in the description so you've at least got the PCB overlay there and I'll also redraw the schematic so that it has all the uh, components refer referenced like C1, R1 etc and that way I'm not really releasing copyright material by releasing the original um, JPEG image of the schematic which belongs to silicon chip. So um, anyway I'm the Astro 30 and if you enjoyed this video please remember to give it a big thumbs up and you can always follow me on Facebook and Twitter in, and the links are in the description as usual. Anyhow this is the Astro 30 saying see ya have a great day.